Oh, thank you very much. I would uh, I'd simply encourage you to attend um, the website and fill out an evaluation following this this workshop. In addition to that, I'd like to call your attention to the uh, hashtag for social media uh, participation throughout the course of the week, and it is hashtag IGF2013. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel panelists that we have today. We do have a, a very imminent uh, panel, so uh, without uh, without further delay, um, one of our panelists is uh, Mr. Ambassador Yanis Karklins. Um, uh, before assuming duties as the Assistant Director General of Communication and Information of UNESCO, Ambassador Karklins served as the Latvian Ambassador to France, Andorra, Monaco, and UNESCO. He was also the permanent representative of Latvia to the United Nations in Geneva. Um, and I'll, I'll try and leave the introductions briefly uh, and simply flag for your attention that full biographies are available linked to our, our uh, panel um, at the IGF's website because um, the panelists uh, that are here today do have uh, tremendous backgrounds and I would encourage you to, to attend uh, that portion of the, the website to, to learn more about their backgrounds. Um, and Ambassador Karkland uh, also represented Latvia in the Governmental Advisory Committee of ICANN and chaired uh, this committee from 2007 to 2010. Mr. Zaidong Lee, immediately to my left. Um, a, on March 4th, 2013, Dr. Zaidong Lee was officially appointed as Chief Executive Officer of the China Internet Network Information Center. Dr. Zaidong Lee received his PhD of Computer Science uh, sorry, rather, Computer System Architecture at the Institute of Computing Technology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2004. He also used to be the Vice President and CTO of Scenic and Vice President of ICANN. Uh, Dr. Zaidong Li now holds the position of Research Professor of Computer Network Information Center of CAS. He's a member of the Academic Committee as well as a uh, member of the Degree Assessment Committee. Ms. Uh, Olga Madruga Forde, sitting in the, the middle of the panel, um, has over 25 years experience as a senior executive in the telecommunications and satellite industries. Um, Ms. Madruga Forte is based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where she represents global and regional telecom companies before the ITU, the Organization of American States, and other standards setting international agencies and trade associations. Ms. Madruga Forte currently represents uh, RSAT SA, an international satellite company based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in all international and regulatory matters. Uh, prior to joining RSAT, Ms. Madruga Forde was Vice President, Regulatory and Legal uh, for Iridem Satellite, where she headed the company's global regulatory market access operations. Um, Ms. Madruga Forte earned her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center, uh, concentrating on international law and graduating as the Belgrano Scholar uh, to the Organization of American States. Um, she was selected by the nominating committee to serve um, uh, on the board of ICANN starting in October 2012 through the general meeting in 2015. Um, immediately to her left is Dr. Laura Donardis. Uh, Dr. Laura Donardis is an internet governance scholar and a professor in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C., and is also a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation located in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, her books include The Global War for Internet Governance, published by Yale University Press, Operating Standards, The Global Politics of Interoperability, published by MIT Press, Protocol Politics, The Globalization of Internet Governance, published again by MIT Press, um, and Information Technology in Theory, uh, published by Thompson in 2007. Um, she was also uh, the executive director of the Information Society Project at Yale Law School from 2008 to 2011. And uh, immediately to her left is Dr. Mark Raymond, uh, research fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, Dr. Raymond earned his PhD from the University of Toronto. 
So as you can see, we do have uh, quite a quite a panel today, and we also have a very challenging, perplexing, and multifaceted topic for discussion. So without further ado, what I'd propose to do is turn uh, now to the panelists for brief introductory remarks of around three to five minutes uh, to introduce a fascinating and captivating topic. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Carklins, if I could ask you to uh, make some comments, please. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, three to five minutes, it's very challenging to, uh, to talk about internet governance. But let me, let me start with the uh, time of uh, when we uh, initiated this debate, 2003, 2005, because that is a starting point of all our um, uh, consultations on, on the subject. First of all, definition. Uh, there, there are two ways of seeing internet governance. Uh, the narrow one, uh, which addresses exclusively management of uh, critical internet resources, and the wide uh, definition or interpretation of, of internet governance, which includes basically everything we can think of, uh, in, including the focus of uh, current international debate of actual use of internet in all its aspects. Uh, secondly, uh, 2003, the main preoccupation of international community was oversight of uh, one government uh, over uh, internet uh, management. And um, uh, that uh, was materialized through memorandum of understanding between Department of Commerce and ICANN uh, with a very clear benchmarks and six month reporting on implementation of those benchmarks. It was really tight leash and uh, a strong oversight. To ICANN version 2003, of course, was a young organization with the not well established uh, procedures and uh, had to have uh, parental oversight and that was uh, kind of natural. When we look to uh, 10 years down the line, this uh, parental oversight has vanished and uh, ICANN has reached the um, age of adolescent uh, when they are almost out of the street and uh, has this very weak uh, agreement uh, called uh, affirmation of commitments. And I think that th this evolution should be taken into account in all our conversation about uh, possible uh, ways forward in addressing internet governance issues. Uh, the um, issue which has not moved much uh, is uh, IANA function and attribution of IANA function. Uh, that still is uh, the point which uh, need to be addressed in one way or another. Uh, it is attributed through the public procurement procedure by Department of Commerce, and Department of Commerce um, is overseeing how uh, IANA function is performed before giving authorization and change in the root zone. Uh, what is different uh, between 2003 and 2013 is that in 2003 the uh, procedure was established by the Department of Commerce, how uh, the change in root zone file uh, uh, had to be done. Today uh, there, uh, there is a, uh, either ongoing or already finished um, uh, policy development process uh, on um, uh, the redelegation and the procedure now is more uh, clear. Procedure is established through multi-stakeholder uh, uh, process and uh, I, I would argue strongly that this is a very serious evolution in comparison with 2003. So whether um, this uh, checkup before uh, changing the root zone is still needed or uh, who should perform that uh, checkup, that of course is the question of discussion and uh, some evolution may, uh, may be needed there. Uh, but but at, uh, at the core, uh, this debate about internet governance is still debate uh, uh, whether internet should be governed in decentralized multi-stakeholder way or internet should be uh, governed in centralized uh, way by one um, uh, stakeholder group, meaning uh, governments. Uh, until now, uh, this seems to me that prevailing uh, opinion about uh, this issue is uh, multi-stakeholder 
a decentralized mode of government governance uh, where every uh, actor every stakeholder group acts in their own capacity and uh, has certain responsibility um, whether that is sustainable in the longer term I, I, my, I personally think yes because that is the nature of internet uh, to be uh, a decentralized system of communications uh, which uh, 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 would would uh, uh, perform in, in uh, the difficult circumstances, so and uh, uh, the governance model should be uh, uh, corresponding to the philosophy of uh, of internet uh, itself. So maybe I will stop here. Um, just one, what I forgot to uh, say at the beginning, that uh, all what I am saying during this panel uh, is not official opinion of UNESCO, and I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Thank you very much, Ambassador Karklins. Uh, if I could now turn to Dr. Zaidong Lee for your remarks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chang. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I'm Zaidong Lee uh, from China. It's uh, from China Internet Network Information Center in Shadi Sinek. So uh, I think it's uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Sinek, you know, it's a public institution and a nonprofit organization. Uh, under Chinese Academy of Sciences. That is why I'm a background of professor. So uh, we, we take the responsibility for operating and uh, administrating for the Chinese tablet domain and dot China and dot I mean both in dot ASCII dot in and the Chinese dot China. So you know I think it's, uh, today's topic is about the the strategic vision for internet governance. So if I think about this uh, topic, you know. There's two two words uh, uh, jumping into my mind. You know, one is for the internet governance. One is for the multi stakeholder model. You know, for internet governance, it's very interesting. You know, uh, if I try to translate this word into Chinese, so I, I don't know how to translate into other language because I only know Chinese and English. But you know, it's very interesting. You know, there's a different kind of understanding for internet governance, especially for governance. There's no no. Uh, Misunderstanding for for the internet, but for governance, you know, in in, in Chinese word we we use a, a, a it's a it's jury. Yeah, the term for governance is a general term, which uh, means to make things correct and uh, just justifiable. I think this term actually catch the perfect idea of why we need internet governance. It's just to make the internet right, right for all the stakeholders. So how to make Make sure that the internet is right for all stakeholders. That's why we all, always mention the multi-stakeholder model. But it's very interesting. But there's different kind of understanding for multi-stakeholder model. Yeah, I think it's like, especially in China. Yeah, I think it's that like so many people think in, in the internet governance model in China is not based on the multi-stakeholder model. You know. Uh, but from my point of view, you know, it's uh, it's based on different kind of understanding. So uh, I think it's the multi stakeholder model is, is some, in some sense it's a, it's a philosophy for the internet governance. But in China, you know, we use another kind of philosophy. Is uh, we call it is uh, make a harmoniousness to achieve win-win condition. I think that is, uh, harmony, you know, harmony is uh, is a very popular word in China now. But you know, it's based on the Chinese traditional philosophy. For the internet governance in China, we also use the, the, the this word. Yeah, as I mentioned, it makes the harmoniousness to achieve women condition. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting how to to make sure the internet is uh, harmonious. So I think it's a, that also is very important: the fairness and the collaboration. I think it's a, just uh, as mentioned by Anis, you know, there's. A, I think in some sense now for current internet governance model is not mean the fairness. There's some kind of unfair, yeah, in the some some area, especially for, for some critical infrastructure management. And also some kind of you know cybersecurity issues. So and also for collaboration, how to make sure that uh, the, all of the stakeholders can work together, can sit together to discuss and then collaborate with each other is also another very important issue. 
for example, even in IGF, it's in the governance forum, but I cannot use Chinese language to communicate with everyone. Yeah, even every workshop or, or, or the main hall meeting. So, you know, it's, uh, in some sense, it's a little bit difficult for other developing countries to, to work together with other, I mean, I mean, developing countries. I think it's not the fault for, uh, for the developing countries, yeah, but it's a reality. How to, to, to make sure that the collaboration spirit is acceptable to everyone, especially how to make sure the developing countries can get involved in, in the governance issues. You know, you know, it's very interesting, you know, even we go to, you know, in Asia is a big country, big uh, region, but if you go to Latin America and also Africa, I do believe that so many younger people, they don't know what is internet and what is internet governance. So I think it's uh, that collaboration is very, very important, but, and, and also the fairness is also very important. So that's my key point, is uh, we need to define the internet governance and multi-stakeholder model very carefully, and to, to achieve this goal is also a long way. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. If I could now turn to Ms. Madruga Forte for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron. I, I would say that we, we've heard some interesting remarks reflecting on events, and um, I think when you are, the title of our panel is about uh, developing a strategic vision. As with any strategy, you properly begin with taking stock. What is happening or what has been happening that is causing us to have to reflect and have to generate a uh, strategic uh, vision. In our limited time, I, I would submit to you to just reflect about events of the past year. Just thinking about what has happened in the time frame of one year allows you to, to see a pattern, a natural progression. And I think it's a, it's a fairly ready way to kind of read the tea leaves and see where things are going. So let's just recap our own lives, those, those of us that, that live and breathe internet issues uh, day to day. Take, go back to November uh, 2012. It's just before uh, the World Conference on Inter, uh, International uh, Communications which took place in Dubai of 2012. And there, that was an ITU conference, and it was supposed to be about just refreshing international uh, telecoms regulations, which had not re been revamped in, uh, in 10 years. A fairly ready task, one would think, except the preponderance of the conference ended up being about very strong debate about whether there should be a regulation of the internet in a broader way and how uh, that should happening, how that should occur. Uh, and the what is now uh, termed the wicket for all of us turned out to be a real uh, bell, a bellwether and wake-up call uh, for many to think about what was happening in the space of internet governance and whether it should go in a new direction. Clearly, of 144 governments that were there, 89 ended up uh, signing a, a new version of the regulations that steers things somewhat in the direction of a broader participation of government in the space of, of internet uh, governance. And they're just very, very quickly reading the tea leaves. The, the rest uh, of the uh, year, we move to April of uh, 2013. Uh, ICANN is convened in uh, Beijing in, in the uh, spring. And we have a communique to the board of ICANN from the government advisory committee considering the introduction of new top level domains into uh, into the internet and by that vehicle the government advisory committee again recommends a, a broader a new attention and a broader uh, recognition of uh, the importance of governmental public policy issues that need to be taken into account in uh, internet uh, governance then right in the middle of the year, we have a very uh, significant, almost cataclysmic 
event of the uh, revelation by a gentleman that we all know by the name of Snowden regarding uh, security and interception issues having to do with the internet, which ends up affecting very critical countries in a serious way. Uh, Brazil, not only by the US, but also by Canada. Uh, France announced as of yesterday, also experiencing interception, and, uh, and Mexico. So the, the debate of how is the internet and security issues being managed uh, significantly augments by mid-year uh, 2013. And many events happening simultaneously. Again, the internet community convened in, in Durban in July of the middle of the year to continue to consider in a sense, gov uh, governance issues by way of the introduction of the top-level domains. And again, the Government Advisory uh, Committee submits to the Board of, of ICANN that issues very specific to public policy, such as the protection of uh, it, the names of intergovernmental organizations, is an important thing to be taken into account in terms of governance issues. They highlight the need for who is directory service, that is, who is behind a, uh, a given site, that that kind of information should be more readily available, transparent and accurate. So uh, again, that underscoring of public policy issues that need to be taken into account in the governance uh, fora. Much of the debate continues to, to percolate up and uh, to the very seminal speech of President Rousseff of Brazil to the UN General Assembly, which is now we're at September uh, 2013, and she delivers what the press, not only myself, but the press has categor uh, characterized as a scathing um, assessment of internet uh, uh, governance uh, generally and primarily reacting to in, uh, interception uh, issues that is followed very quickly with support by UNASUR, which is essentially the, uh, the NATO of the southern countries of the America's uh, hemisphere uh, completely backing, that is seven defense ministers immediately uh, backing President Rousseff's assessment of the need for some immediate and serious action on the topic of internet uh, governance to just last week uh, at a meeting of uh, CTEL, which is the Inter-American Telecommunications Commission of the Organization of American States, for the first time issued a uh, resolution uh, sending recommendations to the uh, ICANN board regarding the protection of geographic names as a matter of uh, public, public policy. So I've concentrated on governmental interest actions, but all the while in that span of the year, uh, many of those pronouncements have been, have had parallel strong campaigns regarding the multi-stakeholder process and the participation of civil society. So I, I submit to you that as we read the tea leaves of this past year of action, what we're really seeing is more than a transformation of just what might happen with internet governance, but a transformation in uh, governance generally, principles of governance generally, uh, globally, moving towards a, a vision of more uh, public citizen participation balanced with the appropriate uh, governmental participation as well in matters uh, very specific to, to public policy and that uh, space. So what we're exploring then in terms of strategy is how best to, to balance those two interests and really how to weave them together into what will likely be some kind of a, a third structure, which is not a, a structure of pure governmental participation, 
but is also new in the sense of realizing a new way for uh, governments and other stakeholders, users, and civil society to interact in the formation of policy. That is the juncture at which we find ourselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those insightful comments. If I could now turn to Dr. Uh, Lord Nardis for her introductory comments, please. Thank you very much, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this panel, and I wish to thank the Center for International Governance Innovation for organizing it. As a scholar, uh, I view Internet governance as the design and administration of the technologies that are necessary to keep the Internet operational, as well as the enactment of substantive policy around those technologies. Uh, critical Internet resources are only one part of the technologies that are necessary to keep the Internet operational. There's also standard setting, there's cybersecurity governance, the private policies of uh, companies that have contracts with their users, architecture-based intellectual property rights, and certainly interconnection and routing. I start off uh, with that because most of this has nothing to do with governments. And many of the discussions at the IGF revolve around uh, narrow areas of internet governance or around symbolic power struggles. But the, the first point I'd like to make is that considerable work is done by new institutions like the IETF and by private industry to keep the internet running. My latest book, uh, which is called The Global War for Internet Governance, breaks down the various layers of internet governance that are um, you know, giving us the digital public sphere, as well as some of the debates that are around this infrastructure. Now, as this crowd well knows at the IGF, there truly are internet control points. There are layers upon layers of functions that are necessary to keep things up and running, but these are not necessarily neutral. In fact, the main theme of my book is that internet governance conflicts create some of the new spaces where political and ec economic power is unfolding around the world. So it's a highly technical area, but it's politically potent because it involves the technical mediation of the public sphere as well as overwhelmingly the privatization of conditions of civil liberties and human rights. So one theme that I'd like to suggest today, um, I debated about this, but I, 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 I want to pick the, the theme of challenging the multi-stakeholder model. In fact, I just wrote a, co a paper with this with uh, Dr. Mark Raymond, so it's very fresh in my mind. Most efforts to study the internet, to study the internet governance, or also to practice internet governance, start from this idea or this premise that the internet is currently governed by a multi-stakeholder model. And preserving this goal is something that we hear all the time at the IGF, as well as elsewhere in the internet community. And what I'd like to do is just raise five critiques of this multi-stakeholder mantra. Uh, first, I see that this is uh, increasingly elevated as a value in and of itself, rather than a possible approach to meeting a tangible objective, such as a human rights objective, or innovation, or operational stability and security. So it's elevated as a value in and of itself, and I don't think that that's necessarily productive. Uh, the second critique is that the multi-stakeholder uh, governance model may not be appropriate in every area of internet governance. There are certain functions that are appropriately relegated to the private sector, uh, narrow technical functions. There are other areas that are the traditional purview of states, and there are other things that are in between. Uh, critical internet resources is probably one of those areas, but there, there's not one so there's not a, a one-size-fits-all model. A third critique is that the concept of multi-stakeholderism seems to be used as a proxy for broader political struggles that sometimes have nothing to do with internet governance. A fourth critique is that uh, multi-stakeholderism and I, I'll uh, target my scholarly uh, colleagues now and I'm guilty of this myself, that it's sometimes described as a way to understand discussions of internet governance rather than actually the practice of internet governance. So there's a focus on multi-stakeholder dialogue rather than multi-stakeholder uh, practice. 
And then finally, I believe that the concern about multi-stakeholder internet governance focuses uh, specifically, uh, too often specifically, on the coordinating functions performed by ICANN. I think part of the reason for that is because of the visibility of what ICANN does. You also see discussions about multi-stakeholderism applied to institutions like the IETF. And part of the reason this happens is because there's um, transparency in the IETF and we see what they're talking about and we can read the standards in other kinds of fora, there's not that kind of transparency. But I feel that um, this phrase is too often employed uniformly and sometimes uncritically and that creates its own risks. So part of this, and this will be my final point, is it stems from this idea of internet governance as a single thing. And I, uh, as many of you do, I speak about internet governance uh, all over the world. And I often get a question such as the following. Well, who should, uh, who should control the internet? Who should govern the internet? Should it be the US government? Should it be ICANN? Should it be Google? Should it be the ITU? Well. This question makes no sense whatsoever, uh, and as I'm sure you all understand, because it views internet governance as a single system. So, uh, the, so the two points that I've made here uh, to kick off some discussion, and I really look forward to the, the audience comments, is that internet governance is not a single system, and that multi-stakeholderism should not be viewed as a value in and of itself that's applied homogeneously to all internet governance functions. So instead, the question that I look at is, what is the appropriate approach to efficacious internet governance in any particular area that achieves certain results, such as uh, human rights objectives, interoperability, innovation, or operational stability varies based on context, both functional and political. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Donardis. If I could now turn to Dr. Mark Raymond for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to everyone for coming. It's, it's nice to see such a good audience at 9 a.m. on the first day of the uh, official event. Um, I'd like to speak to a couple of areas where I think social science and, and political science, because that's my training, can contribute to internet governance. And I, I say that with some humility because uh, I don't have a technical background and, and until relatively recently I wasn't an expert in internet governance. Um, and I, I still would be very hesitant about making any claims to such expertise. So the first thing I, I think that political science can contribute um, to the study of internet governance is to note that uh, as Laura did, just like internet governance is not a monolithic thing, the multi-stakeholder model is also not a monolithic thing, and I think there is some real benefit in studying that in a more disaggregated or, or decomposed manner. And the way I think we can do that is by looking at variation in the classes or types of actors who are participating in a given mechanism, and by looking also, as a second dimension, at the nature of authority relations among those actors. So if you look, for example, at a contrast between ICANN and the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, both are multi-stakeholder organizations, or at least commonly regarded as such, but they work very differently. And if you look at the procedures and the rules of those two organizations, they look almost nothing alike. And when we talk about the multi-stakeholder model, it does really some conceptual violence to what's actually going on and can hide more than it reveals. So that's the, the first point that I would like to make here today. The second point, which stems from that, is that there's also a great opportunity to study multi-stakeholder governance rather than multi-stakeholder internet governance because multi-stakeholderism now exists outside of the internet issue area. And I'd like to, to briefly flag two areas where I think there are some great opportunities for broader comparative study. And this is the kind of thing that political scientists uh, like to think we do reasonably well. So the first is uh, the area of financial governance. And, and just as an um, example, I will propose the International Organization of Security Commission uh, organizations. So this is IOSCO is the acronym. And it's the uh, global organization that looks at uh, stock trading and securities trading. And it includes both government securities regulators and industry self-regulating groups. So that's an example of multi-stakeholderism. But it's not related to the internet. 
The second is the Global Compact at the United Nations, which is an exercise in trying to develop corporate social responsibility. And their materials explicitly adopt the discourse and the, uh, the, the terminology of multi-stakeholderism. So again, that's an, an, an opportunity for comparative study. And there's also, I think, um, a terrific opportunity to, to think more carefully about corporate social responsibility in the internet space as well. And that's uh, sort of a, a separate point, but one that touches the same material. So in addition to those two points, I'd like to close with kind of a brief evaluation of, of where I think we are in the current political situation. This picks up and, and relates to comments from many of the other panelists. And what I would say is that we're seeing right now an exercise in rulemaking. And my own work looks at the politics of rulemaking in the international system. It's clearly what we're seeing here. Uh, the problem with rulemaking um, in a context where people disagree on how to do rulemaking is that it tends to founder on procedural issues. And this is part of what we saw at Wicket, and it's part of what we can expect to see in the future. We can expect to see a great deal of difficulty in this space over procedural issues until and unless we sit down and realize and discuss these procedural differences. There are a range of procedural views among states. These are common uh, stumbling blocks in international relations. But this space is distinguished by two other um, procedural wrinkles. So first of all here we have a technical community which has very horizontal, very distributed, very peer produced egalitarian models of procedure that play very poorly with conventional state models. We also have a corporate model of decision making based on shareholder and board accountability and based on the management of relations via private contracts. And again, so we have a, a real diversity in decision making and, and rule making procedures. Great. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists for those insightful uh, introductory remar remarks that have set the table for what I think promises to be a very fruitful discussion. Um, so what I'd like to do now, I'd propose to turn it over to the audience for questions. And in order to keep it fair for our remote participants here today, I propose to take one question directly from the floor, and then I'll turn to our remote participants for one question from uh, people participating remotely, and then back to the floor, provided there's no strenuous objection. And uh, we can engage in a uh, interesting uh, dialogue. I see one question from the floor. Uh, Manu, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for an uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Manu Bardwatch from... I feel like a game show host here. I'll run out. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, presentation and opening uh, statement. Um, Manu Bardwatch from the U.S. State Department. Uh, the U.S. government is very excited that at this uh, IGF, we are in a position to say that we made our first donation to the IGF uh, Trust Fund, a contribution of $350,000, which demonstrates our commitment to the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, for this panel, uh, which is fittingly titled Developing a Strategic Vision for Internet Governance, I wonder if we could also develop a strategic vision for the Internet Governance Forum. Um, the forum, and in particular, the question is, I'm very curious to hear each panelist's perspective on how the Internet Governance Forum is doing. Do you feel that enhancements could be made to address concerns of the developing world, to deal with the issues broadly of the desire of some governments to have more of a role in Internet policy making? Do you feel that it's a fittingly a multi-stakeholder organization that's effectively addressing internet questions. What is the value of the IGF? And as we look to the future of the IGF, are there enhancements that you would like to see made? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pindar, for, for <laughs> running the microphone. It's uh... Very kind of you. Uh, and Manu, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of the IGF, I mean, I, I guess what I would say is that in GigaNet yesterday, someone uh, had commented, and I, I hope the information is accurate, but it was very interesting. They, they commented that civil society is actually the largest single group 
uh, here by uh, how people have uh, self-identified. So what that tells us is that there is at least a reasonably vibrant uh, you know, civil society perspective, and I don't have, have a breakdown, but from the people I've met here, it seems to be very global. There seems to be a, a diverse representation of perspectives. It's my first IGF, so I mean, it's, it's highly anecdotal, but that's one thing I would say. So it appears to be doing vibrantly, I would say. And I mean, I know there were um, some difficulties with planning the meeting, but the meeting has been carried off in a really uh, wonderful manner. And I'd like to take the opportunity to, to thank the, the host committee for that. It's been a great meeting so far. Um, the one thing I would say with respect to enhancements, I wonder about the extent to which we should treat the IGF as a governance institution. I think Laura's point here about distinguishing between dialogue and practice of governance is an important one. And so the risk if we focus on the IGF for enhancing developing world participation is that we um, get a situation where there's participation in dialogue but not participation in practice and that could lead to real concerns about legitimacy. So if I, if I may. Um, I, I feel a bit guilty or responsible for IGF. Uh, going back to uh, 2005, that was the um, second phase of the uh, WSIS uh, Tunis uh, summit, uh, which uh, made this decision to create IGF. And uh, IGF was created as a discussion forum because it is obvious, uh, at, at least at that time, uh, that there was not sufficient understanding of complexities uh, surrounding internet governance and therefore uh, the annual gathering of different um, or representatives of different stakeholder groups uh, was useful to clarify issues. Uh, IGF has never been uh, or has never meant to be a decision-making body because that would change completely dynamics of, of the uh, of the meeting uh, and would require immediately uh, putting in place certain procedures, uh, starting with the procedure of accreditation and uh, representation. Uh, that is, uh, that would certainly stifle the spirit of discussions which are free-floating and uh, uh, without um, uh, maybe pointing to a rigid uh, views of certain institutions. Now, whether there is a room for improvement, uh, certainly there is. Uh, the, the environment is changing and um, maybe we need to, to think about uh, uh, further uh, sort of improvements uh, in the processes which either precede or follow IGF because idea when IGF was uh, created was that people come, uh, they talk, they uh, try to understand uh, problems, they try to understand uh, concerns of others, and then they go back and make necessary decisions where these decisions should be made. Either that is intergovernmental circles or that is uh, 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 boards of organizations uh, and so on. So uh, most probably many things uh, are discussed and decisions taken as a result of engagement in IGF. Simply, we don't know about it. For instance, let me let me give you an example from uh, my own organization. Uh, together with URID, uh, we are uh, now third year in a row analyzing the uptake of IDN CCTLDs. And uh, we see that uh, as a result of this analysis, what are the gaps and shortfalls. And um, uh, Director General of UNESCO uh, this uh, spring uh, made a public uh, statement uh, calling on a technical community to uh, uh, continue efforts in uh, resolving remaining uh, technical issues related to um, uh, IDNs. And that was clearly a result of this work and um, uh, engagement with uh, uh, stakeholders here in IGF. So that is uh, just example that there is an action which comes after that um, uh, the debate we had uh, here. And I believe there are many other examples, simply we do not know about them. So. I'll be um, <clears throat> very brief. We, I know we have so many different 
areas to touch upon today, but regarding the IGF and its strategic uh, vision for the future, I would submit it's, it's extraordinarily successful. It is a remarkable space for dialogue, and it has reached, though, a level of maturity where it needs to think about the, the next growth uh, platform. And w one area to concentrate on is how to bring into the IGF or how to make the IGF known to many other references to look uh, with a very spare definition, a very simple definition to say, okay, multi-stakeholderism means any instance where there are two uh, actor classes, and this is the approach that Laura and I take in our paper. We have four actor classes in general, states, international organizations, firms, and then what we call the NGO class, which is admittedly very broad, includes individuals, civil society movements, formal NGOs, et cetera. But uh, as social scientists, we, we try and simplify and then, and then work from there. So that's our analytical approach. But that's not to say that the ethical uh, questions aren't critically important. They are. I'll just add uh, one thing to that. I think it's an excellent question. And um, where, in, in my opening remarks, I suggested that not everything needs to be multi-stakeholder, but where it is and where it is needed to be multi-stakeholder, I usually think about the principles in three different ways. One is participatory openness, where people have the opportunity to have their voices heard, to be in the room. At the IGF, are we all allowed in every room? In other, you know, that's about the discourse. But in some institutions, is everyone allowed in the room? I think the participatory openness is an important part of it. I also think that informational openness is critical. Having proceedings, minute meetings, discussion groups, and all of the kinds of records of the deliber deliberations be openly available and having that kind of transparency. And then finally, I think that implementational openness is critical, and that has to do with the outcomes. Let me give you an example of that. Um, I, I mentioned the IETF before, so I'll stick with that example. The IETF has openness in all three areas for the following reasons. One is because anyone is allowed to participate. Two, because they make the standards themselves available so that there can be public accountability, so that there's the opportunity for people to look at it, to assess the public policy implementations the, the, and implications, and to actually see what's going on. There's transparency. And then finally, there's implementational openness in the sense that having these standards openly available results in, in this case, multiple competing products that are based on that standard. So it has the openness um, in all three areas. So that's one model, one way to look at it. I think those are excellent principles. And in the principle of uh, part participatory openness, I, I, another aspect to take into account is cultural and linguistic uh, differences. For example, if I were to do this and say, en la gobernanza del internet, uno debe de tomar en cuenta tal y más cual otro principio, most of the room is gone except for uh, my colleagues from Argentina over here. So in, in terms of the future of our platforms of, of dialogue, much work needs to be done in, in that area of inclusion and, and openness. Okay, we're uh, able to take another question from the floor. I see uh, one here, and the gentleman in the front row, please. Yes, thank you. Um, my name's Ian Peter. Um, I'm interested in looking at a distinction within our discussion on this um, over-analyzed word multi-stakeholderism. And um, the reason I do so is that what I see within our group is all sorts of different structures. And whether we be governments or civil societies or um, uh, technical groups, I see meritocracies and I see democracies and I see dictatorships and I see anarchies and um, I see no clear boundaries between groups. Um, many of us are crossover, trans, <laughs> <laughs> boundary sort of characters who fit very much into all of these different characters. And, and this, to me, creates a need for a clear distinction because I'm a firm believer in multi-process dialogue. 
um, sorry, multi-stakeholder dialogue. I'm a firm believer in multi-stakeholder uh, multi process. But when the word multi-stakeholder governance is used, I find this is something that we are nowhere near um, uh, sort of mature enough to use in any sensible way. And I, I believe that would just be an excuse for um, some structure where the, <laughs> the powerful would rise to the top and many voices would not be heard. So I'm interested in people's analysis on the panel of the usefulness of multi-stakeholder governance as a term. Multi-stakeholder with process, multi-stakeholder with dialogue, I'm quite happy with, but multi-stakeholder governance to me is extremely problematic as a concept at this point of time. So. Great, thank you very much for your question. Who on the panel would like to uh, begin? Mark? I, I think that you, you raise an important question and an important point, and uh, part of it is that multi-stakeholderism can be used as a concept to elevate whatever power structure is currently in place or to take power. So you see that, and, and I'm not just criticizing governments, but we could, we could look at all kinds of forces. In particular areas, you can see how maybe private industry would try to get more power um, by having something become more multi-stakeholder in order to have uh, certain market advantages or incumbent advantages. In other cases, you can see governments uh, using multi-stakeholder, and we do see this, to, to get power. Um, it's understandable that they would want more power in certain areas of um, internet governance, uh, but multi-stakeholder can be used as a proxy as a way f to have more government control. So I, sh I share your uh, caveats about it, and I think that's part of the reason why it shouldn't be homogeneously applied to every particular area. For example, uh, what, would be an ex what would be one area of um, internet governance that is highly privatized right now? One example is um, interconnection, where there are private arrangements between network operators to connect. And we've seen in the last year proposals on the table to introduce greater regulation into those areas um, for multi-stakeholder reasons. So that's an example of that. And that may be an area that is more appropri appropriately remaining with the private sector because of the importance of rolling out interconnection in a way that is fast and efficient and involves private contracts, having government intervention. Um, some people have raised the issue of, well, could this just be another surveillance point where the interconnection is, having governments there? Is it just another way to, um, to enact censorship? So the caveats are well-founded, and thank you very much for raising that point. I think we can. We should not uh, uh, over uh, complicate uh, thing. Uh, there, initially, this inter, uh, multi-stakeholder governance model was proposed uh, to um, say that each stakeholder group uh, should have its own role and responsibility. And uh, when we look to the uh, internet, really as a global system then each stakeholder group uh, has its own responsibility in terms also in governance. But then when we look to the internet in, in entirety, say all this big system uh, should be governed in multi-stakeholder way, understanding that in each individual piece should be done by either governments or technical community or uh, businesses and, and, and so on. So in that sense, there, in my view, there is no contradiction of uh, a multi-stakeholder governance model if we take it as a, as a, a system in its entirety. So first of all, I'd associate myself with uh, the comments made by both of the other panelists, which I think are excellent. The thing I would add, you know, in terms of the caveats, could this just be, you know, a way for the powerful to exert more control? Absolutely. But the same can be said of any other form of governance. I mean, political science is a discipline that studies the exercise of power. And we find that everywhere. And we find that in government. We find it in hybrids, like the multi-stakeholder model. We also find it in private industry. So. 
yeah, I'm not sure it's a problem we can avoid. It's a problem we can do better to, to resolve and to, to try and commit ourselves to procedural fairness and to substantive fairness. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a, a ubiquitous problem. Thank you. My name is Renalia Abdurrahim. I'm on the advisory committee representing internet users in ICANN. Um, I have some reactions to the comments that have been made by several panelists, and um, I'd like to state my comments, reactions, and then invite further comments from, from the panel. Um, Ambassador Karklins raised the issue of sustainability of multi-stakeholderism in internet governance. I think there is sustainability in terms of the dialogue, but in terms of effective multi-stakeholder governance, the practice of rulemaking, I think it's not going very well. And um, the dialogue happens in the internet governance forums, but it doesn't happen in the decision-making or rulemaking entities because of the silo structure. I mean, it happens to a certain extent, but there are limitations to, to that. that it's just my belief. Um, Mark had said that um, rulemaking stumbles over procedure due to differences in norms, and norms take a really long time to evolve. And in forums like the IGF, people get to understand about the differences in the norms, but when they, they go back to their own decision-making fora, some of that doesn't come across, and it is a stumbling block. But apart from the issue of language and culture, there is the problem of capacity to engage. And that's not adequately addressed, although ICANN, for example, has lots of capacity building initiatives in place, but getting there is a problem for various stakeholder groups. For the governmental advisory committee, I would say it's an issue. For the internet end user community, that's also an issue. But beyond that, the capacity, there's also the process of engagement in terms of structure, how and stakeholder, stakeholders are structures and how they're engaging. And um, the GAC, as far as I see, does not participate in policy development. And that is a problem, and they have their own reasons for doing that. I want to come back to Laura, in, uh, where she says that multi-stakeholder model may not be appropriate in every area of internet governance, and I agree. Um, but how would these technical decisions factor the public interest when, um, when decisions are just made by a narrow band of stakeholders? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the critical point that you make. And um, I just want to, to add to what you said, and then I'll try to answer it. Um, there are... Even, even in a completely multi-stakeholder environment, there are barriers to participation. So even if something is completely open to participation, some of these uh, fora and some of the decision-making areas require a great degree of technical expertise. And I'm someone who has two engineering degrees, and I can't even pretend to understand every area of internet architecture, while I do understand a lot of it. But I know that for others, it just doesn't make any sense. It's, so, so there's the barrier of expertise, there's the barrier of money to be able to be funded to go to the events, and a lot of things uh, in, provide remote participation. But a lot of decisions are made in the hallways in various fora, and so the, the barrier of money is a really big one as well. And then I would also add to um, what my colleague Olga has said and what you said about cultural barriers. And it's not just about um, regional culture, but also uh, comfort with culture in an actual institution. So if there is um, an organization that has a norm of wearing uh, shorts and sandals, that's not comfortable for everyone around the world. I'm, I don't know why I use that example, but there are all kinds of barriers. Now, in order to provide, um, to, to address the public policy, area, the question that you asked about how do you account for public policy. Uh, the starting point for that is that I, I believe that all arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power, no matter what it is. Even the most, the most technical, that was the subject of my book, Protocol Politics, about the politics within the technical standards. So even in that kind of an environment, you're setting public policy. So sometimes nuts and bolts are just nuts and bolts, but in many areas of technical architecture around the internet where our culture, our discourse, our innovation, our systems of finance are dependent on the infrastructure, it does set public policy. And that's where I come back to this area of transparency. So if you have an organization 
in which all of those barriers exist, but you allow for the specifications, for the proceedings, for the minutes to be aired, then that, to me, is the only thing that provides the necessary accountability for policymakers to see what's happening, for civil society to happen. And indeed, we have seen examples of civil society becoming involved in some of the standard setting organizations, for example, keeping those barriers in mind. But that's the crux of the question, is how do you account for the public policy uh, considerations when you have an area that is highly technical, and even if it's open. Okay, uh, Ronaldo, you raised an, an excellent point, so I will cut right to the seminal word in your uh, statement, which is silos. And if you think about the multi-stakeholder way of decision making on a global uh, basis, as a human experiment, it really is in its infancy. There is uh, no other model uh, like it that you can hark to in history that has worked at this kind of uh, scale. So considering that it's in its infancy, what, on, on the outside 15 uh, years, there is a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of room for learning regarding what's not going well and trying to make adjustment. Silos cannot stand. Sometimes they are inevitable due to technical expertise. Do not let me in a room full of ITF, uh, IETF scientists that need to get a job done as a lawyer. That is not helpful. So, but what we need to do is look at unhealthy and um, unhelpful reasons for silos and break them down wherever we can as we continue to improve the process. No, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I understood the, uh, the comment uh, that there is no decision making elsewhere. Um, I, I can speak about intergovernmental organizations. So ITU has at least two um, uh, council resolutions or, or plenty put resolutions on internet governance. Uh, UNESCO has a number of um, uh, general conference decisions related to internet governance. So in, in that sense, this is what international organizations are doing. And, and at, at the governmental level, internet policies most probably exist in every, in every country. And the, there is a certain degree of decision making where it should be decided. But maybe I misunderstood your, your, your point. I think you mentioned that on behalf of the users in the ICANN community. So, uh, so I, I want to give a, a comment. You know, now there's a, a significant limit of the current implementation for the multi-stakeholder model and how to engage the different kind of stakeholders, including the internet users. Uh, I think now is uh, overemphasizing on the on the every stakeholder's right to to participate on the internet governance instead of balancing its focus on the actual deeps and uh, effectiveness participation so i think now the in other words, in another word, uh, all the numbers uh, stakeholders have been engaged by this model even we think it's not enough but most of them haven't got the ability to put push forward the, the bottom-up policy-making system. How, how to make sure that every participant have been getting involved in the policy-making system. And the next step should be how to, to extend the scope for that. Thank you very much. I saw that we had two questions over here. Now, as the moderator, I have to be mindful of time. We've got about 15 minutes left. So what I propose to do is collect the two questions simultaneously. Obviously, we have another question in the back. So we'll collect those three, four questions, um, and we'll turn it over to the panel and let them kind of choose how to respond. And then ultimately, uh, I'll just have to, we'll have to be mindful that we only have about uh, 15 minutes left. So uh, the, to the gentleman in, in the white shirt here, please. Uh, Pindawong, Hong Kong. Just wanted to a very quick question, uh, kind of building what John's uh, uh, metric I issue. Um, do you view multi-stakeholderism as a euphemism for avoidance of capture? Okay, we have one question over here. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. I'm Ellen Strickland from Internet New Zealand. I wanted to ask um, around the idea of the strategy for internet governance moving forward and the idea that we're at a point where we're looking at next steps and appraising the structures we have and what's needed going forward and to really reflect on the discussion about multi-stakeholderism and the processes and how that applies to the formation of that strategy going forward. So where and how do we create that strategy for internet governance going forward? Um, you know, is it here, well, should it be a multi-stakeholder process? And if so, where and how? <clears throat> uh, Mike Gerstein. Um, uh, I guess the question uh, that might be asked here is, um, we've talked about multi-stakeholder processes, we've mentioned multi-stakeholder governance, uh, and an intermediary is multi-stakeholder decision making. Uh, I guess the question is, is multi-stakeholderism in this way a substitute for democracy? Uh, are we presenting or are those who are presenting the multi-stakeholder model uh, presenting it as an alternative to the democratic process uh, and to answering the extremely difficult uh, problems, uh, some of which are technical, some of which are procedural, uh, that arise in an internet-enabled world, uh, but one where the principles of democracy presumably should still prevail. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to make a question about the the first uh, point of view that we heard here, and I, I have doubts about your perspective of the IANA functions and their contract. I think in 2015 uh, the actual contract expires. So in order to achieve new new strat strategies. Uh, I would like to know if you, if we should expect some changes about this this contract, and if we can expect uh, new models taking into account the the declaration of Montevideo and all the concerns are uh, the concerns that it's about the the subject. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. And if I could ask the panelists in their remarks to these these wonderful questions, I think the underlying feature that unites all of the questions that we've heard, or at least a lot of the dialogue, is the challenges and opportunities to, for internet governance in the in the near term. We've heard about the principles that underlie governance. We've heard about the more specific terms of, of governance. So in your view, while you're answering the questions, if you could turn your mind to the challenges and opportunities for internet governance in the next five years. And I'll ask uh, Ambassador Carklands if, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Um, so thank you. I, I maybe I will uh, speak about two two things uh, about IANA uh, function. Uh, the attribution of the contract, most probably the uh, the the best would be asked uh, to the uh, U.S. government officials, Department of Commerce. Uh, because that is a legal issue. Uh, but when I was uh, speaking about IANA uh, function, I was referring rather to the um, uh, authorization uh, which is done uh, by Department of Commerce of any change in the root zone file. So that, that, is, that was a matter of concern and that is uh, still a matter of concern uh, of many. And uh, uh, I think that there might be some evolution or should be some evolution in order to alleviate or address those concerns uh, that Department of Commerce is uh, uh, checking the um, process and uh, without uh, give, give a go ahead from Department of Commerce, no change, even the change is justified, can be made in the root zone file. So that is not really uh, uh, acceptable by many. Speaking about the strategic vision and where we're going, uh, I, th I think um, we, we need to follow the, the due process in, in that reflection. Uh, first, we need to take stock where we are. We need to identify what issues we, need, we want to address. Then we need to uh, uh, project what would be the best solution. 
uh, and then take necessary actions. I don't think that we, sh we should act uh, on emotions. So now uh, we, we have learned uh, something very shocking. And based on that, without uh, really vision, we would move to make some decisions. I think that would be not, not right. I'm not saying that we should not uh, go ahead and, and um, uh, do, uh, make necessary adjustments in internet governance uh, 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 system, but uh, we really need to know what is the issue, what we are trying to address, how this issue should be addressed, and what steps should be taken. So that would be the right uh, approach in my view. See if I can uh, weave your questions together because they actually do come uh, together. When you think about principles of democracy in a multi-stakeholder process, I would consider that the term democracy might more typically be associated with national individual state processes. Uh, whereas the experiment that is our multi-stakeholder uh, model is a way of making decisions in an, uh, in an international uh, context, but not only international in the sense of states, but international in the sense of states, civil society, technical uh, experts, uh, Etc. So, with that in mind, how to move forward with this experiment? And part of that participatory process involves listening and short term and long, long term goals. When you listen to what people have to say on a global basis, there is a clamor regarding the level of maturity of the IANA uh, contract and, and process. And I believe that that has served a very important and significant uh, purpose over these past years, but it is uh, ready for a next incarnation, as well as the fact of um, ICANN as a California nonprofit organization. So there is a lot of interesting discussion about how we continue uh, to transform those two elements of the uh, of the internet uh, currently within the context of a multi-stakeholder and truly uh, global uh, process. And I would expect uh, to see both of those elements uh, change in a shorter term process, shorter I mean years, uh, versus the long-term evolution of multi-stakeholderism. I think it's um, important to view the internet as we view other enormous collective action problems that are of a global scale, such as environmental issues, such as global security, such as human rights, where no one culture, no one nation acting alone can have governance or affect the entire structure, but that the local actions of cultures, entities, and governments can affect the whole. So it's a, collection, a collective action problem. Now, the final point I'd like to make is that is one about interoperability, openness, and universality of the internet. It's very easy to take infrastructure for granted, but I remember when I uh, first started in the computer networking business a long time ago how uh, one person couldn't send email to another person very easily. Corporations used um, different protocols like systems network architecture and DECnet and you couldn't communicate across institutions in the way that we communicate today. It's an amazing thing that's happened to have interoperability and to have open standards that make all of this available and to have a universal network. And this is not something that we should take for granted. I think that there are two trends that are problematic in this regard. One is the turn to infrastructure for content control. We see this time and time again, whether graduated response and three strikes kinds of laws that enforce intellectual property rights that can interfere with um, infrastructure, or see the turn to the domain name system for content enforcement in a variety of ways. I believe that these trends, particularly the use of the domain name system for content enforcement, can take us away from the universality and the interoperability and can um, eventually end up fragmenting the internet. And uh, I also believe that there's a turn away from interoperable standards. We see a resurgence of proprietary norms in cloud computing 
in e-health systems and in other areas. And it's important to continue with openness and the kinds of approaches that enable a universal internet. So I think a big win in the future would be having the kind of reliable infrastructure that we have now that creates a universal internet and not fragmenting that into non-interoperable segments. Um, so I'll try and address a, a couple of the questions and then I'll, I'll try and kind of add my own thoughts on challenges and opportunities. So with respect to whether multi-stakeholderism is a euphemism for capture or a proxy for democracy, I guess I would say that with respect to being a proxy for democracy, I think some of the underlying concerns about representation and participation are there, but we shouldn't conceptually confuse multi-stakeholderism with democracy. Uh, with respect to the question about capture, I guess my question is capture by whom? Right? right now, I think a lot of the worry is about capture by governments. But if we look comparatively at other areas where we see things that look like multi-stakeholderism or where we see things that look like the privatization of governance, which is a very important theme that Laura has identified in this area, in that case, the danger is regulatory capture by industry. And we saw some really dangerous things in, in the lead up to the financial crisis five years ago. I mean, we can go too far the other direction. So, you know, I. It's a matter of, of capture by whom, I guess, would be my answer to that question. With respect to where we should be developing this strategy, I say everywhere. I think civil society needs to do some thinking about this in every country around the globe and also internationally, international civil society. I think governments should be thinking about this and should be talking to each other about this and talking to their citizens about this. I think academics and, and scholars uh, have a role to play, but then again, I would think that. Um, and then in terms of challenges and opportunities, I'll flag two challenges and one opportunity. The first challenge is procedural legitimacy. Uh, so the, the point I made about different views about how to do rulemaking, I really think we need to address that in this space. The second challenge picks up again on something Laura said. We need to avoid solving what are essentially human behavior problems with technology. We need to be very, very careful about that, not only in content control and IP enforcement, but in other areas. Technological solutions to human behavior problems tend to work very badly because humans find different ways to keep doing the same things they're doing. We need to solve the human behavior problem, uh, if it is a problem, and it may or may not be in a given case. Finally, I would say that the opportunity here, I think, is hopefully to leverage what is now much greater public awareness and interest in these issues in order to have a balanced discussion about what it means to have a responsibly governed internet. Okay, so very well, quick, quick comment. Yeah, you know, for I think democracy is a very uh, good solution for the social governance. Mm -hmm. But you know, now we are trying to to find an, uh, a good solution for the internet governance. Maybe the multi stakeholder model is a solution, but we need we need continue to improve that and to to find the perfect solution. But I think it's, it's not reasonable if we, if we have a perfect solution, but we need to negotiate with one country government, it's not reasonable. So that's why we considering the, the specific solution, uh, question for any functions. So it's very, very important to to change the current situation to make sure that our uh, bottom up policy making system can be effective for everyone. We don't, don't need to negotiate with one government in the last minute. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for an insightful discussion uh, today. Unfortunately, we've uh, we're coming to the end of our of our time together. Um, I'd simply like to remind everyone uh, to fill out the workshop evaluation forms available on the IGF's website. I'd also uh, like to call your attention. I know that this is such an engaging topic that an hour and a half can simply not do justice to the level of complexity that, that we're touching upon. But it strikes me, the one observation that I would make is that we are doing the work of internet governance in this room. The level of discussion that we've had, the representation that we've had from industry, from civil society, from government, from all of the key players, this is the discussion that we're having now. And this discussion, couldn't come at a more important time. This is truly a watershed moment in, in internet governance. So I'd like to thank all of you uh, 
for being here today. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our panelists, and Ambassador Yanis Karklins, Dr. Zai Dung Lee, Olga Madrugaforte, Dr. Laura Denardis, Dr. Mark Raymond, Cambria Olding, our remote moderator. Uh, my name is Aaron Shaw. I'm legal counsel at the Center for International Governance Innovation. I, uh, and again, thank everyone for being here. This has been a, a truly uh, excellent experience. So thank you all, and thank you to our panelists.